good afternoon. Welcome to our second lecture of uh, 141. A uh, couple of things I uh, need to talk about, not much, but uh, number one, we decided in the discussion sessions there will be here uh, Friday, 1 to 2. So we'll basically try to use this. And we'll see if actually some of those could be taped as well. Again, if you don't make it, you might be able to see your discussion left, uh, session live, so we'll talk about that. Uh, labs will start next week. We're still kind of wavering a little bit, but I think we'll keep Monday and Wednesday. So that makes it easy. We don't have any problems with coverage. But for the time being, I'll try to do mon Monday and Wednesday labs. Uh, homework number one is due on Monday. And some of you say, well, gee, I haven't been able to start yet. So I have the class account forms here. So we'll basically pass those out at the end of the class. So you have an account, and you can start rolling. Uh, if you're enrolled in the class, if you're on the official roster, you should be able to make it into 125. Uh, your card key should work by now. Uh, so try it out. Because I want to make sure that by next mon Monday, when you start the labs, that you should be able to get in there. Um, there's a couple of computers where you can log in that are generally available for your usage. It's called Cori, Quasar, Pulsar. In 125, there are some. Mm, you look at there, just let me pick a red pen. Um, if you look at 125, and you go to the entrance of that room, uh, you will see that I think the left side there's a row of uh, sandbox or Linux boxes, which are uniquely reserved for 141. So these are your machines to use for labs and things like that. You use for there's 12 machines I think. If you go to the homework assignment, you will find the names of those computers. I actually tried to log in, and it seems to be all operational, and everything seems to be fine. Uh, but you can uh, log in to those computers from remotely as well. So you don't have to be physically in the lab room to use the computational resource, neither on Quasar, Pulsar, and Cori, or of any one of those uh, Linux boxes that we have out there. So you can remote log in and do all the kind of stuff you need to do. So that's the nice thing about all those networked environments. OK. So that's uh, what I had in terms of administrative announcements. So I'll basically let you know about the labs. I'm meeting with Katarina somewhat later in the afternoon. We'll make final decisions on the lab times. You should be set for that. And I think we're ready to roll. Yes. Um, I looked on the website. Do we have like a, a schedule of reading assignments? Yeah, so I'm, I'm still trying to bring the account. I'm, I'm playing around with BSpace. It's something that I'm doing. In the past, I always had kind of the complete semester schedule already online, trying to figure out exactly how to do that in the best possible way with BSpace. But I definitely would like to do that. It says, here it is, this lecture, this uh, should read that amount of information, things like that. So what I'm going to do is bring up a temporary syllabus. I was hoping to integrate this into the calendar, but I haven't figured out yet how to do that. <laughs> uh, because uh, they have a very nice calendar tool in BSpace, but I haven't really found all the kind of goodies that they can offer. So I might do something temporarily different, where you see the schedule, lecture one, this date, here's what we're going to cover. That's the reading assignments for those. OK? I'll, I'm working on that. As I say, it's a learning experience for me as well. Uh, but I think at the same time, uh, BSpace offers a lot of interactive capabilities that makes it a lot easier to do projects. Uh, we have discussions about certain topics and so on and so forth. That's why I kind of decided to switch. OK? Any other questions, things that are unclear? All right. Yes. Where do we turn in our homework? Um, two options. Uh, homework number one is actually quite straightforward. Um, we, it's an electronic only submission. So I'll put up an email address where you can send it. It's going to be e 141 class or something like that, uh, where you can mail it to, and that automatically goes to class account. For the other homeworks, um, I'll leave you the option. You either have the physical. You print it out, or you write it out, or whatever. It's a written thing. Uh, you turn it to 240. If you go to 240, Corey, it's kind of the students, common student space. You go in there. There's a box which says 141. You throw it in there. The other option, if you really like to do everything online, electronic, and things like that, just mail it. Um, and more and more, like uh, project reports, all of those things are going to be electronic. Um, it's so much easier. Uh, it's, it's getting a lot more easy to, to manage. You get easy to put uh, diagrams together, put hyperlinks to simulations, or whatever you want to do. Uh, with electronic music, you can do so much more. You can make a website for your project, whatever you want to do. Right? 
So, um, so electronic if you want to, but for otherwise, if you want, you want to scribble out a comp uh, solution to homework, just write it out and put it in the box. Okay. All right. Any other questions? Okay. So what we'll do then is um, I figured out how to erase all those things. Um, I did some studying. Okay. Oh, uh, something I would want to point out before so going one step too far. Oops, where am I now? Here. Okay. Something I want to point out. Actually, the first homework, what you're going to do is use cadence and tools and things like that to do run simulations. And the simulator you're going to be using is Spectre, but it also could be Spice. We have both of them basically available, H Spice or Spectrum. So now you might wonder why people always talk about Spice decks. So you look at the Spice has a very peculiar <coughs> input language. You describe a program, you, if you do schematics and you enter, you go to the environment, you might never see this file. But that's the input to a SPICE program. It is basically a net list of components that are connected together and a set of commands on what to do with those components, like what the input waveforms, what output waveforms we'd like to see, what are your time steps, all those kind of things. So this is the, the format that SPICE uses. It's kind of a, you have a set of lines, and each line is a component typically, like you have a set of inverters in this case here. Like, um, this is, these are two calls to inverters, and this is the description of a sub-circuit which is called an inverter. And each of those elements here is a transistor. One of them is a PMOS transistor, the other one is an <coughs> MOS transistor. You have a couple of supplies, and then you have a set of commands. <coughs> so that's the way SPICE works. It's really kind of a list of all the components and how they are connected together. And what the parameters are, commands and supplies and input that you apply to it. Now, why do we call this a SPICE deck? Uh, it's the way it's still called. People, in anywhere you go in a company, people say, get me a SPICE deck. Why is it that way? Well, actually, SPICE was written in 1960. Uh, 1960, of, for one of those big mainframe machines, IBM 360s or whatever they are, the computers that people are using at the time, and the way you entered programs in those things were two-punch cards. Um, so like this. This is a, an example of a punch card as was used to program computers. You had a whole stack of those, and you put them in a reader, and the reader would brrrr, it reads all the cards in and reads the program. Now, each of those cards is equivalent to a single line of text. And what allows you to have 80 characters on a single line. That's the way it was defined. That was exactly what you could put on the card. And, and the way the program was defined in there, you set a big machine, a teletype, and you make holes in the cards. And the holes are basically ASCII locations. So you code every character as an ASCII character. You can find you see all the little black things you see on these cards, like the, one of those here? That's really a punched hole. You punch a hole in the card, and it says if there's a character there or not, a one or a zero, basically. So, um, this, this was called a deck. And the nice thing about this SPICE program was that actually it didn't matter how, what the order of the cards was. You could drop your whole deck and you put it back together and you put it back in the machine and it still wouldn't matter. Except for the first card and the last card. The dot end card always had to be at the end. And the first slide was the title of your program. So that's why we still call it SPICE decks. It's really something that comes back from the 1960s when we used punched cards to basically write programs. And I thought it was kind of an interesting background to be aware of. All right. So I have a couple more things to do before we go um, to the topic of today's lecture. Today we're going to talk about metrics. And by the way, all the material I'm talking about right now are really basically from chapter one of the textbook, plus one of the appendixes, which is CMOS manufacturing. Okay, so this is a chapter one of the textbook is really what we're covering to right now. So. Um, Last lecture, I talked mostly about the future of Moore's law and where integrated circuits are going, where they've been going, how we have improved basically in terms of performance, cost per transistor, transistor density, but how this impacted power. Uh, so um, I want to do a couple more things to discuss some of the future issues that are basically lurking, which make it interesting. And then we're going to go into metrics. Um, metrics kind of seems boring, but ultimately it's absolutely crucial, right? Whatever you do in a job, you try to optimize something, right? Design is optimization. You have a problem, and I'm trying to come up with a solution 
that meets all your constraints you've basically put down. That's to me an optimization program. So it's very <coughs> important when you do optimization that you understand what the cost functions are. What are the type of things we're trying to optimize? And why do we use the metrics that we use today? Why did it make sense in the circumstance that we're talking about? So that's what I'm going to talk about is what are the metrics for this, how to measure cost? And I'm going to give you a small intro to IC manufacturing as a background because it will help you to understand the cost of an integrated circuit. OK? So um, we talked about all the scaling, Moore's law. We talked about all of that. We basically um, introduce a new technology generation every two years. Uh, and every technology generation, by accident, scales down your feature size by a factor of 0 0.7. Now, you might ask yourself, that's a weird number. Why would I basically go, let's say, 180 nanometers? Then why would you pick next generation to be 130 nanometers, and then 90 nanometers, and then 65, 48, 32? Why do you pick those numbers? Well, it's always a factor of 0 0.7. 0.7 sounds weird, but if you take the square of it, you square 0 0.7, you get 0 0.49. That's 0 0.5. Actually, what's happening, every time I scale technology generation, the area goes down with a factor of 2. That's exactly what's happening. That's why we have the scaling factors of 0 0.7. Every time you basically reduce the size of your device by 50%. So that's the nice thing about it. So it means that every time I scale technology, I can do with the same chip size, I can do two times more functionality. You can double the amount of memory, or you can two times more processors down there, or you can make more complex functionality. While the cost of the chip per se doesn't really increase that much. Well, that's not really true. I'll show you why that's not completely true anymore. But, uh, the, but the chip cost, the silicon cost, doesn't really go up that much. So that's kind of cool, right? Same cost, double the functionality, cost per function goes down by 50%. Right? So I have something, a processor that costs so much a year, if I scale down 50% of the cost. But it's never that way. What you always get is double the functionality for the same cost. Right? Any device you buy, it's always the same price. A game machine costs 199 or 299 or something like that. It's always 299 But every time you buy a new one, it does more, a lot more. So you get double the functionality for the same cost. So um, that's why we scale technologies. It's pure economics. Right? It's, 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 I really want to keep on attracting new customers. We want to give them new functionality. We want to convince them that they should buy the next generation. Next generation computer, the next generation cell phone, or whatever device, game machine, or whatever you have. You always want to get more for the same price. Now, at the same time, um, the problem now is that your chip gets two times more complex as well. I, I double the functions. Now, to design that chip, um, you have a problem, right? Um, question if I now would like to redesign the same chip with double the functionality, pure linearity <coughs> reasoning would say that I have to double my design team. Right? I have to do two times more transistors. So every time you go to the next generation, your design team goes two times larger. Now, that's fine for one generation. But if you do this, time after time after time after time, you get an exponential increase in the number of engineers you need per chip. Which means if you need 100 engineers 10 years ago, and we differ every two years, you have two to the fifth in 10 years, two to the fifth, uh, five generations of technology, two to the fifth, that's 32. I need uh, 3,200 engineers in my team, and so on and so forth. That's not scalable. Because what it really would say is that if you wait long enough, all the engineers in the whole world would be working on a single chip, which is um, not very attractive. And uh, this would be kind of what I call a monopoly to the extreme. So that doesn't happen. Actually, it turns out that size of uh, teams on chips design pretty much have stayed constant. They, they crept up a little bit. They increased over time. But they have pretty much stayed constant. So what has happened? Well. Actually, we made our engineers work harder. No, we make them work better, right? Uh, that's the set. How can you make an engineer design two, two times more transistors in the same time? Right? That's really what you're looking for. Can I increase productivity of an engineer with a factor of two? That's the question you're basically trying to address. And that's exactly what we've been trying to do. And the way you do it is you give them better tools. You give them better methodologies, right? You allow them to work at the level of abstraction that's higher. While in the first microprocessor, 
you basically design every transistor individually. You size every transistor, you put it down, you put the layout of every transistor, manually you go transistor by transistor by transistor. <coughs> Today, most digital engineers won't ever see a transistor. They won't even know what it is. Well, unfortunately, they should better know what it is, but uh, uh, you write a program, right? But somewhere you write a piece of VACL, Verilog, or higher level, uh, system C, system L, all those languages and abstractions we have defined to be able to capture more functionality more effectively. So methodology has been very important. Different level of abstractions <coughs> are absolutely essential. I'm going to skip to that for a second here. So that has worked well. Um, but it has some challenges. And this is why people kind of are saying, well, you know, if you look at the next generation chip design, you have uh, two kind of contradictory type of things happening at the same time. On one side, I call it proportional to, or proportional to one over the deep, uh, uh, DSM is deep scaling, right? Deep scaling manufacturing. Um, if you think about this one here, one over DSM is if this feature size gets smaller, I get more complexity. This is a microscopic thing. So you have more complexity. Well, time to market hasn't gone up, right? Um, every time I want to get a new product out, I better get it out quick. The quicker, the better. Uh, actually, I think time to market has shrunk. Well, in the past, a new, bring a new line out would take so much these days, and you see new products pop up almost instantaneously. People had an idea, and a very short long time later, people start putting up new products. So time to market has not gone up. But during that same time, I have to do more complex things. So you have mul multiple gates, and so on and so forth. So people have dealt with, as I said, higher levels of abstraction is one. You don't consider, I said, a RAM is a RAM. I don't care exactly how the individual cell is. I just say I need a megabit or two megabyte or a, or a gigabyte of flash memory. And that's your, the way you define it. And that's the way you look at it from the higher level system perspective. So you create l higher levels of vision and visioning the different functions. The other thing that basically has helped us a lot is that obviously I don't redesign every single transistor every time I make a new chip. Right? Obviously, with a company like Intel, it, life is kind of easy, right? Well, easy. Uh, it's never easy. But you already have a product. You have a microprocessor, whatever it is, Xeon, da -da -da, quad core, da -da. So you, next time you go to your next generation, you don't reinvent everything from scratch. <coughs> Actually, you borrow as much as possible from the previous generation. Maybe you scale in the technology, you make the transistor smaller, but the overall function, circuitry, and all these kind of things remain the same. We call it reuse. Reuse is very important. Reuse as much as you can. Use libraries. Now, this is true for hardware, but you do the same thing in software, right? You know, if you write a software program, nobody in his sane mind would basically invent all the graphics packages. You just have a library, you link it in, and you're done. The same thing we're trying to do in hardware. Uh, reuse components like memory modules. Reuse microprocessors. If you look at some of the things that are being done now, um, like take your cell phone. You, if you have an, um, an iPhone or something like that, it's probably about six ARM processors in there. In that thing, six different processes, all made by a single company, ARM. Now, ARM is a company that doesn't sell products. They have no, there's never, you're never going to buy a chip from ARM. But everybody mu buys microprocessors from ARM. They deliver the processor, uh, the software environment that goes around it, and I want to put another chip, I pay licenses fees from them, and they import the processor onto your die. So you buy intellectual property from other companies. Uh, that's another way of basically making sure that you can actually go up the ranks a lot faster by reusing components. Very important thing. So that's an important issue, is basically looking at complexity and say we have changed methodology as a result of that. On the other side, something that's hurting us is that, as I men mentioned last lecture, one thing I mentioned is the reason one, uh, that digital works so well is that we have a very clean bottom level abstraction. Everything which is analog, we ignore. And we turn it into ones and zeros. So from that point on, I don't have to worry about voltages, charges, currents anymore. They're gone. I think about ones and zeros. Now, that works very good as long as it, that assumption stays valid. 
that I say, okay, this waveform, that's a one, 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 zero, zero, zero. If I'm not sure anymore, it becomes a little bit vague, you have a problem. Right? If I say, well, it might be a one, 90% sure it's a one is not sufficient to make a computer that works all the time correctly. You have to be 100% sure. Now, if I have five volts of supply voltage and a terminal noise sitting there at millivolts, and you might have some variability of your threshold. Yeah, the threshold might be a volt, but it could be 1.1 volt or 0. And it doesn't matter that much. You can see that very easily it's for me, it's quite easy for me to translate these analog voltages into digital ones. I say 5 volt, 0 volt. Now assume that I scale down my technologies. Everything becomes kind of molecular. Right? You, you end up to nanometers. Voltages have to shrink. Right? If I put 5 volt over something which is a couple of nanometers, you're going to see sparks. Right? The thing is going to blow apart. So you scale voltages. You can imagine what's happening, right? Voltage gets smaller. Terminal noise doesn't change. Right? Temperature is there, KT over Q, fixed factor. So terminal noise becomes an important factor. Now you can see that making this decision of this is a 1 and a 0 might become harder. Right? Uh, you have less margin uh, to make clear decisions. So that's some of the things that are happening today. We are now sitting at devices that are very, very, very small. Uh, voltages have dropped substantially. Uh, noise becomes an issue. Uh, variability becomes an issue. If I have now 200, let's say extreme, extreme case. Let's say I do design at 200 millivolt. Nobody does yet. Well, some people do, but not many. <coughs> 200 millivolt. Now what do I put my threshold on? If I put my threshold at, let's say, 100 millivolt, just an example. But I'm not sure about that threshold by 50 millivolt. Right? That's huge. Right? It basically varies all the way almost between the two supplies, from 50 millivolt to 150 millivolt. So variability, the fact that I cannot really exactly tell what the analog value is because it depends on manufacturing, all those kind of things, might change how we make decisions. That's going to make life harder, too. So once you start going closer to those very small dimensions, we see microscopic problems pop up. This one's here. Noise, crosstalk, reliability, manufacturability, power dissipation, leakage, clock distribution, all those type of things play. So saying that I can just be a very happy digital designer and work with Verilog and VHDL all the time or these high-level languages and ignore everything that's below there, you never look under the hood, you have a problem. Because sun suddenly something might not work anymore. Something that basically is because of the, all those effects here. So trying to come up with solutions for those problems in such a way that I still can do this is an interesting challenge. And that's really what we're facing in digital design today. Come up with new circuit art strategies, new architectures in such a way that it can still make things that are bigger, faster, larger, more complex, and still work all the time is really, really the challenge of digital design today. And that's kind of what we were going to walk through during the semester. We're basically going to show you why, how it was in the past and how some of the new things that are emerging as a result of those very small dimensions might actually start hurting you or helping you, whatever you want to look at it. OK? All right. That's that. So um, let's clear this out and let's go to I'm going to skip that. Design abstractions, I mentioned that, I already mentioned this. This is a picture of how you can basically abstract away different levels, right? If you're at the bottom of the totem pole, well, uh, you're a physicist probably. Uh, right? you, think about, you think about molecules and Schrodinger's equation and things like that. Now, we're not going to go on quantum physics. We're not going to go there. Uh, semiconductor physics. But if you look at the design, the level of abstractions you typically deal with is the bottom level we're going to deal with in this class here is the device. Somewhere we have a set of components. MOS transistors, resistors, capacitors, uh, wires. These are the elements that we're going to get from our friends that are technologists. People who do 130 and things like that, they design those things for us. And they give us beautiful models, hopefully. Models that are correct, hopefully. That's what you care about. So device is the first thing. So what we're going to do in this class 
is first putting devices together into circuits. Right? You put a couple of transistors together with some resistors, and you get something that does inversion, NAND gates, NOR gates. So circuit level analysis is you have a circuit model for a transistor, for all the elements, and you put those transistors together, and you get some function. Uh, you can go one step up and say, well, now I know that that combination of transistors is an AND gate, right? or NOR gate, or whatever it is. At that point in time, I can forget about transistors altogether. I just use Boolean elements, NAND gates, NOR gates, so I do logic level design. Now, you can go one step further up. Basically, just NAND and NOR gates are kind of annoying too, right? What I care about is adders, multipliers, dividers, things that do uh, complete components, like memory subsystems, buses, and so on and so forth. So you have modules. It's the next level. You think about large functional blocks. And then you go one step up. Well, you call it system, but <laughs> system is always a hard thing. What is a system? Right? For somebody who does device, putting two transistors together, that's really system level design. Right? So for somebody who does microprocessors, somebody builds a whole box of components, that's somebody who does system level design. But above modules, you start thinking about larger level IP blocks, right? Complete processors, uh, memory subsystems, uh, interconnect subsystems, and all those kind of things. And then the next thing, you put it all in a box, you put software on top of it, you have compilers, it looks like a complete processor system or a software system. And you can put a whole bunch of those together in a server machine. And you put a bunch of those together, you get a data center, right? But so levels of abstraction keep on going upwards. Right, this hierarchy of layers you think about. But in this class, this is really what we're going to cover. We're going to go all the way from device level to module level. Um, I'm not going to do, well, I'm going to maybe do some processor type things, but mostly we stick at module, module levels, like memory subsystems and so on and so forth. OK. All right, let's do that, annotate, and let's go to the next. Okay, so gets me to the topic of today, design metrics. Right? Again, how do you judge a certain block? What's the figure of merit you're looking for? That's really the question you're asking yourself. If I do certain things, and my, uh, how do you specify what you need to expect? And how do you tell that your design meets those expectations? And again, um, like everything in design, there's never a one-dimensional space the overall design space is always going to be n-dimensional. So there's a variety of factors you turn to look at. Cost, as I mentioned, is a very important one. Keeping price down is if you, the one that basically has lowest costs designed for a certain component is going to win, right, typically, if at least it meets the other specs. Uh, reliability is very important as well. How sure are you that your component is going to work? I know I've seen many, many 141 projects where people come with really amazing things, a very nice performance, and I look at this as that thing is never, ever going to work if you put in a real chip. <clears throat> because you're sitting so much close to the boundaries that everything that varies a little bit, you're going to be toast. Right? So reliability is very important. Building margins is very crucial. Performance is a very important metric as well, right? Um, I, I, as a user, expect something. If I do a video player, I'd rather make sure I have enough frames per second. Uh, 59 frames per second is not enough if you expect 60 frames per second. You have to be able to make that speed. Uh, so the frequency of operation, the speed of the operation is a very crucial performance thing as well. And then finally, power. Uh, it used to be a side effect. Nowadays, as we discussed last lecture, has become just as important. If you have a cell phone that runs out of battery in about 30 seconds, nobody's going to be by it. Uh, you have to be able to get you know, seven, seven hours, 10 hours of duty cycle before you recharge it, something like that. So all those things play and are quite important from an overall role perspective. All right. Let's talk about cost. Um, economics 101. No, it's actually not even 101. It's probably a freshman class in economics. Uh, what is cost, right? What is going to determine how much you pay for a chip? Well, if you basically sell the thing on the market, obviously you, you want to make some profit, but I'm, I'm, not, I'm keeping that out. Right? Uh, depending upon the market, will the, the market will determine how much profit you can afford. 
But it, let's look at the actual cost to you for building a component, a chip, an integrated circuit. Well, as you can see here, there's two components to it. And you might have heard this term before, but you might will definitely heard it, hear it a lot more in, the, in, in your future life. There's two components. Well, it's something we call the recurring cost and a non-recurring cost. The non-recurring cost means that I'm designing a new component. Right? Before I even can start thinking about fabricating that chip, I have to do a whole bunch of stuff. Right? I have to design it. Um, so the fixed cost to design is a fixed cost. So if you make one component of a million components, that fixed cost is not going to change. It's independent of the volume of the number of components you make. So for instance, design time and effort, the tools you have to buy, right, all your CAD tools, you, that's a cost you pay. You, somebody has to pay it back to you. Uh, mask generation. Every time I make a chip somewhere, I will come back to that in a second, I have to make masks. You make the masks one time, but it's a cost that you once again have to take into account. It can be quite expensive. As I mentioned, I think last lecture, 20, uh, what is it, 50 nanometers, $10 million for a mask set. Right? So you start thinking, well, if I'm going to sell one component, means I have to sell that chip at least already for $10 million. Right? It's an obvious type of thing. So, so you better worry about those type of things. Equipment, all the equipment you buy the measurement equipment, all the test stuff, all those things have to be part of that fixed cost. So that's one part. The second one is what we call the recurring cost. That's the cost that is proportional to the volume. So how much does it take me to make one more chip? Right? And obviously it's silicon processing. The more silicon processing I do, the more chips I get, so it's proportional with the number of chips. So silicon processing, import packaging. Every chip needs a package, so, uh, so you're going to take some labor and putting it in a package. It's proportional to the volume. Test. Every chip has to be tested. If you don't test it, it's not like this way. You get all the chips back from the fab. They all work. They don't. So you have to put all of those to a tester and say, this one works, 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 doesn't work. Sometimes for the bigger chips, maybe you get a yield of 60% um, or 50%. Some of the smaller chips, I might 99% might be working. We'll come back to that in a minute. Now, it turns out that most of those costs, the recurring costs, are going to be proportional to your chip area. So a bigger chip is going to be more expensive than a smaller chip, and actually quite strongly so, as I'll show you in a minute. So but be aware of that non-recurring cost, recurring cost. Okay? And that's going to determine what volume you can afford. So what has happened in recent years is that the NRE of a chip design has gone up, right? Uh, the fixed cost to do a design, because of the complexity, because of the more advanced cost of mass, the increasing cost, of NRE has risen. Yes? The question on the NRE, could you, it seems to me that you'd be able to expand the cost out over multiple generations, or at least a couple of generations. Yeah, oh yeah, 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 no, absolutely. I'm, I'm looking at it as a one-time thing right now, but if obviously, you are a company that does a sequence of chips. You have a family of chips coming out. Obviously, some of the manufacturing, uh, the equipment costs, test costs, tester costs, and things like that, you can write off. Um, masks, however, are not. Masks are a one type thing. Design time, the same thing. Some of the design you can re reuse basically allows you to basically write it off over a family of products. And that's very attractive, obviously. If I basically have a chip house, and I have to do, I'm going to have a library of components. Say, hey, you need an amplifier, here's an amplifier, here's an A to D converter, here's that. Try to reuse them. Don't reinvent your new A to D converter every time around. Reuse them because it helps to keep the cost of my chips down, obviously. No, very good remark, absolutely. Oh, yeah. So, now in order to understand chip cost, the, um, a little bit better, I think it's worthwhile to think a little bit about the IC manufacturing and, and, and understand what is going to determine the cost of our um, uh, IC. Now, as I said last lecture, IC manufacture as we know it is all due to two people, Robert Noyes, Bob Noyes from Texas Instruments, uh, uh, sorry, Rob, Bob Noyes from Fairchild, and then moving on to Intel, and Jack Kilby who was at Texas Instruments. Actually, it turns out that the patent of Jack Kilby was filed about six months before the one of Intel at uh, Fairchild, but they covered different things. They were complementary. They sued each other for a while, and then they agreed and they shared it. 
in the early 1960s. But both, so that's why both of them are basically claimed to be inventor of the integrated circuits. So there's an interesting thing if you go, I have a little link here, the tale of two brains, how each of them independently came to this whole thought process of why, why is it advantageous to be able to manufacture many transistors at the same time. So uh, some uh, 143 material here. Uh, who is taking 143? Nobody's ever been in a lab and make a diode. It's kind of fun, though. Yeah, you should do it at one point in time. Make a diode. It's, it's, it's not much more. It's N, and you do some diffusion. You get some P. You put some oxide on the thing continually. It's, you look at the color. You put in the light. You say, oh, my oxide is thin enough or thick enough, something like that. It's pretty cool. Uh, but anyhow, so that's 143. So, but I'm, I'm going to give you whole 143 in about five minutes, OK, uh, in a nutshell. So if you look at a transistor, this is the 3D vision of a transistor. So what we have, um, this is, by, by the way, an old-fashioned fa transistor. It's not a modern transistor by any means. But it, it helps you to understand some of the steps in the process. So what we have is, first of all, a, a wafer. You start with a wafer. And I'll show you wafers in a minute. <coughs> it's, a, it's a piece of a circular thing of silicon, uh, a couple of millimeters thick. And that's what we call our substrate. That's what you get from the manufacturer. You buy a bunch of those wafers. Uh, they can be of different types. You have P-type wafers, N-type wafers, depending upon the doping of the material. So old-fashioned transistor, the way you make a transistor is um, you have some isolation regions, which are used to basically separate transistors from each other. Right? Obviously, if I put transistors next to each other, you don't want to have them to interfere with each other. You don't want to have current to flow from one source to the drain of the other transistor. So you isolate them by putting uh, some oxide blocker silicon dioxide. You make a trench, and you dump it, fill it up with silicon dioxide, and it acts as a pure insulator between your transistors. So you have this field oxide sitting in between the different things. And then you have, in between here, you have exposed silicon. This is silicon dioxide. That basically everything, everywhere you don't work, you put the silicon dioxide. Where you want to make transistors, you leave the silicon blank. And then what I do is I create some N plus implants. If I want to make an NMOS transistor, so P-type material, N plus implants, source and drain. Okay? And you have a silicon dioxide, very thin silicon dioxide over your channel. It's the region between source and drain. Uh, it's gate oxide, very thin, nanometers thickness today. And then I put some stuff on top of it to basically make the gate. So you have the source and drain and some stuff on top of the silicon dioxide, um, which in the past used to be polysilicon. Nowadays, it's back to metal. Um, the newest processes use metal as the interconnect material into the gate. However, in this class, for sake of sanity, we're going to keep on using polysilicon as the gate connector. It's only after 32 nanometers that people start doing metal gate anyhow. So what you see is N plus, N plus, gate oxide material, polysilicon connector. And then you have to make connections to your source and the drain. So somewhere we need some stubs in metal that connect to our metal layers which could be aluminum or copper. And that allows us to connect our transistors together. OK? So question is, how do you create something like this? This looks very complex. How do I manufacture many of those transistors, up to billions or trillions of those transistors simultaneously? Well, the answer is quite simple. Is indeed what was the core of the invention of the integrated circuits. It is a process called photolithography. It's, that's the core of the whole thing. What it says is you can create a film. It says you're going to do this in steps. We're going to build your process. You're going to start with your wafer. And gradually, we're going to basically build layer after layer after layer after layer. But each step is applied to the whole wafer, to all the transistors simultaneously. That's what's reducing the cost. I can make a billion transistors simultaneously by using this process. <clears throat> and the way we do it is as follows. So every one of the steps is translated into a set of geometrical patterns that I want to basically manage on the die. Sources, drains, gate regions, whatever you name it. So all these geometric features I'm going to put on, uh, which is kind of a film. We call it a mask. It's a film like the good old, well, you guys might not know about good old photo film anymore. Everything is digital these days, so you don't have to go and make develop film anymore And if you want to make pictures. But that's the way 
it's still done for chip style. You create a polymer and you put the patterns all down on that polymer and you make it and you make them the real size type structures. And then what I'm going to do is um, let's say I take my wafer. Suppose um, interesting thing, there's some pictures missing here, but I think it's just arrows. I've got all the pictures. I missed the arrows uh, on this slide. So suppose I want to do oxidation. Uh, so, or no, let's suppose I want to do some etching. Etching is used to remove some parts of the material. <coughs> Turns out that every step of the process always starts with the same thing. <coughs> Most of the time, we're going to do some oxidation first. All right, you build, you put your wafer in an oven, you cook it for a while, you have oxygen flowing over it with some wet stuff. You basically blow it over there. You put it at 500 degrees. And what's happening is silicon, if it's bare silicon, it starts to oxidize because the oxygen flow over it and you start growing silicon dioxide, a whole layer of it. And as I said, you can easily see on the color, uh, it changes colors depending on the thickness of that silicon dioxide. So that's the first thing you do. Uh, you build that silicon dioxide. You have a layer of silicon dioxide now on top of the whole wafer. And I want to remove certain parts of it. So how would I do that? Well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to code this um, wafer now with some chemical. Like you did in the good old photography days, a chemical that you can develop. Something, it's a chemical that when it sees light, it's going to harden. And when it doesn't see light, it it's remains soft, or vice versa. Right, so... <coughs> It's a chemical that's getting developed under the influence of light, photons flying into it. Okay? So I put that photoresist over the whole wafer, chemical stuff, you throw it over there, and then I'm going to put this thing in a machine, which is called a stepper. Stepper costs you about, like a 747 right now, a single stepper. Uh, they're not cheap. They're very expensive pieces of equipment, a couple of hundred million dollars. So you put it in, and what you do is, in that stepper, I'm going to take that film that I developed with all the patterns, put it on top of the wafer, and shine light on it. Okay? Now you can see that because of the mask, certain layers are going to get exposed to light, other areas don't see light whatsoever. Right? So what's going to happen is that chemical material is going to develop. It's going to change features. You remove the mask. Uh, you put some, so that's a stepper exposure. You go with that little mask over all the pieces of your wafer, such a way the whole thing is covered. Um, and then you throw some other chemicals over it afterwards so that the, what was exposed really gets hard and the other ones remain soft. So you have that pattern is now built into that chemical. You put it into some liquid acid really nasty materials. You don't want to touch them with your hands. They're really nasty, nasty uh, liquid uh, acids. That's going to take the soft polymer away. The soft chemical is going to get away. The, the photoresist is going to take it away. So now you can see you have your wafer. Um, and you have patterns where you have still resist, which is hardened, and other places where it's totally removed, where you're back to the bare silicon. And now I can do whatever I want to do. So suppose I want to do uh, implant. I want implant N pluses or P pluses. You put in an implanter machine, you shoot the parts at it, particles go at it. Some of them get stuck in your photoresist material or in the layer that you have built up there. Other ones go straight into the silicon. So you have partial exposure to N plus. Or I can do another etching step and take some of your silicon away and vice versa, and vice versa, and vice versa. And then you clean off the whole thing. After you've done, you put in another chemical that takes the, that removes the photoresist that still sits on top. Removes the photoresist, you clean everything, again with some acids and nasty stuff, and you're ready to do the next step, where you again build a layer on top, expose it, do some etching, whatever it is, and over and over and over and over again. So that's really how we make wafers, how we make dyes. Basically, continuously that photolithography process is ex executed. And the same thing is always build up, expose, remove some of the thing, do the steps, clean, go to the next thing. Right? So metallization is the same thing. I put a whole bunch of copper down, put a mask on it, do all the stuff, basically expose it, 
remove an exposure, and then to etch away where the copper was put, it, put down. So that removes it, and in your place, you have a very nice pattern of copper being built up. That's the, amazingly, this is the stuff that was invented in the 1960s. We still use it today. Some changes, though. Obviously, the patterns we're trying to build are getting thinner and thinner, smaller and smaller and smaller, right? We're talking about nanometers versus in the past. The first process was a 10 micron process. Now we're talking about 10 nanometers, three orders of magnitude difference. So obviously, we have changed the type of light we're using. If you put light on there, and that light has a very large wavelength, you cannot get very precise patterns. So what you do is shrink the wavelength of the light we use to expose those things over and over again to the higher wavelengths. To, sorry, to higher frequencies, uh, shorter wavelengths. And that's where the cost of those steppers come from. We were using very bizarre light sources to basically make those things happen because you really want those small features. But that's the bottom line here, and that's really something that is worth understanding. Yes? What's your time frame? Can like a bear die connected to the wave? And it can go, depending on how fi the fast they rush it um, to a fab, um, I would say three weeks. Three weeks from masks, you get masks, the bear die comes in, you start doing the thing. Two to three weeks is a typical number if you really go fast. But that's about the, the, the because some of those steps take long. Like, for instance, some of the growth steps, they have to be in the oven for a while. Other steps can go quite rapidly, like dry etching that goes quite quickly. So it depends on the whole thing. But about two to three weeks is the right number, approximately. Um, it is amazing how those fabs are automated these days, actually. It used to be these clean rooms, and you had people walking around there in bunny suits and things like that. No more bunny suits. Um, this thing looks like a train station. You have little trains flying around, little shuttles with wafers in there. They fly around. They have a whole track system. They go from one piece of equipment to another one. They come down like a little, psh, little elevator brings the things down. They go right in the equipment. Uh, totally automatic. The equipment grabs the wafers, does all the stuff. When it's finished, puts it back out there goes back in the train, goes to the next piece of equipment. It's uh, pretty amazing, a uh, very modular structure. And you don't need a complete clean room anymore. You only need clean room in the equipment and in these little shuttles that move things back and forth. So humans can just walk around there without basically uh, making spoiling anything of the silicon. Um, the other interesting part that I saw, I, I visited one of those fabs about a year ago or something like that. The other interesting part is that humans basically, the only reason there are still humans there is to do some, they look if everything is fine. They, there's always measurements being done. Every step you have to figure out, is my thresholds right? Is the thickness of this material right? Do I have to have polishing? So there's a bunch of measurements going on continuously. And that's really what the humans do in that space, is check basically reliability, see if the measurements basically uh, measure up to what you expect to see. So that's that. So this kind of explains it in a different way. Let's um, give you an example here. Um, it's important because once you start seeing this thing, you will understand why transistors look the way they are and how some parameters of trans transistors can vary because of it's purely a result of the whole processing steps they go through. But let's say that I want to build um, my field oxide, for instance. Right? Remember, you have your transistors. In between transistors, we have a thick oxide that isolates. So let's so, suppose I would like to build something like that. So what we can do is, in this case, we would start with bare silicon right here, a silicon substrate. That's your wafer. Um, then I said what you do is you put your wafer in the oven, and you build your silicon dioxide. You flow oxide over it, silicon dioxide grows. And it's very linear with time. The longer you wait, the thicker the oxide becomes. Okay. So I've done with that. Then I put this photoresist material. That's this development material, right? That's kind of this film I'm putting on top. Next step, I take my mask, and I put a light source on it. Line, we shine, shine basically light on it. Line comes through, and basically you can see some pieces will see light right here. Everything is in the middle doesn't see any light at all. So. Part of the material of that chemical, the photoresist, will develop, will be exposed to light, will change its chemical nature. Next thing what I'm going to do is um, harden the resist, put some chemical in it to make sure that the pattern is really that thing that it got exposed gets really hard, the thing that wasn't exposed stays soft. And then I put in an etcher. Etcher could be 
using liquids, acids, things that eat stuff away, that's the nature, or dry etching where you basically shoot ions at it. It's pretty violent, but it works quite well. It's a dry etcher, as we call it, or plasma etcher. You basically shoot hot plasma at it, eats the material away in the area which are exposed. So in this case, you can see we take, first of all, the resist away, and then we do another etching, and we eat all the way to the silicon dioxide, down to the bare silicon. Then I remove the resist using a chemical process, and bingo, I have a wafer where everywhere there's a layer of silicon dioxide, except to the places that didn't see light, which are now becoming staying bare silicon, and that's where now I can start building transistors and so on. Okay? So as I said, it's 1.43 in about 10 minutes' time. That's what you learn there. Now, this kind of is interesting. This is a, it's not a new picture. It's uh, something from the early 90s. But this shows how complex these things become. This is a, a IBM chip, which has about, um, about seven layers of interconnect and where they etched away all the intermediate material. So the only thing you can see is the copper that's left over. So you can see the patterns that have been built. These are all pieces of copper are stacked on multiple layers, typically the silicon dioxide in between as an insulator. But this is your idea of how an interconnect structure on a chip would look like. It's like a freeway system with overpasses, underpasses, and all these kind of things. But think about it, instead of having two or three layers like the freeway system, we might, today we have about 10 layers of interconnections you can put on top of each other. Um, and again, the way you build those things is exactly the same thing. You have your wafer. Now, after then, I've done all the transistors. You can imagine, you put some areas, you have silicon dioxide, you have gate areas, you have polysilicon. You can imagine that the surface of your chip becomes kind of hilly, right? Uh, yeah, I put patterns here and patterns there. You can see that they're not going to be kind of flat. So if I now have to put metal on top of that, it's kind of hard. You're not going to get very good connections, and they might break. Right? If it's too steep and you put a piece of metal down, you can imagine that thing is going to break right here. So what do you do? Well, there's another very famous development. Somebody discovered people tried everything in order to planarize. So you say, well, I, can, I can have this whole wafer. It goes like this. I dump a bunch of silicon dioxide over it. I just dump it on there, and it becomes like this. Uh, people tried everything to make it flat. Till somebody says, the thing that works best is sandpaper. Right? You grind it down. And lo and behold, it works. It's called chemical mechanical uh, polishing, CMP. It is really, you put a wafer, and you spin it on a slurry, which has part abrasive particles in there, and you rotate it really, really quickly and you basically sandpaper the whole thing flat. Once you've done that, then you can start building all your metal layers. Every time you put some layers down, you put it back in the slurry, you polish it again, so that you have a very nice set of horizontal layers to keep on working on. So that's a very interesting part of the process as well. But this is complex. Uh, you can see there's 10 layers of metallization. Every one of those metallization steps means that you have to put metal down, you have to etch pieces away, you have to put basically contacts between the different layers. All those type of things have to happen. OK, so this is kind of more like a modern CMOS process. Well, not really. This is pretty outdated already as well. Uh, but again, what you see here is two things. You have a substrate. You have a substrate. It could be P plus, N plus, doesn't matter, depending upon the type of material you use. You have silicon dioxide stoppers between the transistors. Then you have, um, what we do in set now is, is we create, on top of your substrate, we're going to create wells. A well is a region that's either P or N material. So you dope your basic material so that it becomes P or N. And in the N layer, when I have an N well, I can put P plus implants in there, then I have a PMOS transistor. In the N region, I have N plus implants, and I have a P channel, it's a P well, I have an NMOS transistor. Right? So you have now regions where you can make NMOS transistors, regions where you can make PMOS transistors. Um, then you put some silicide. Actually, it turns out, we'll come back to that later. Um, we just put N plus material for the source and the drain. It's good, but not good enough, because N plus is not a very good conductor. 
the resistance is quite high, so it means that my transistor gets slower. We don't want that. So you put a little simple layer of some other material on top of it, silicized, we call it. It's like a silicon which is doped with something like tantalium or something that has a better conductivity. You kind of make a sandwich. Something that's not very conducting, a layer on top of that better conducting. And you make sure that they connect very nicely to each other. Uh, that's important, right? You put layers on top of each other. You want to make sure that there's no diodes forming in between or barriers. You want to make sure you have a very nice electrical conductivity between the two. So low resistance, high resistance, the total thing is low resistance. Then we build our gate stack, silicon dioxide, gate oxide. You put your poly, whatever, on top. And then you want to silicide this thing as well because that's going to reduce the resistance of yours or the silicon as well. And then you do some weird stuff on the side. I'm not going to talk about little side things. And there's a whole bunch of what's called gate engineering. You make sure that your electrical, electrical fields behave right and all this kind of stuff. Anyhow, something you don't have to worry about if you're not in 130 or 143. Um, 141 doesn't bother that much about it. Then when you've done that, you put silicon dioxide down, a whole bunch of that's yellow stuff, and we start building gate uh, to interconnect layers on top of it. It's like Manhattan. You keep on building higher and higher and higher up. Now, obviously, if I make metal connections, I have to also have verticals. You have to have elevators between layers. So these are called vias or contacts. Something that goes, you relate to, let's say, to go from level, level 2 to level 5, from level 3 to level 7, or whatever it is. Right? You have to make those vertical connections as well, which, again, in modern processes are mostly going to be uh, copper um, or aluminum in the older processes. Okay, so that's where we are at. So, um, now, how does that translate to you? Right? There you are. As you can see, this is a fairly complex process. Um, a modern process might see about 30 masks or something like that that you have to basically apply. And some masks are used many, many times for different type of operations. So obviously, you as a designer are not going to bother about doing something like this. All right, that's too complex. Whoops. Let's go back to my previous one. Stop documentation. Go back to previous. You as a designer definitely are not going to bother trying to do this. All right, that's too complex. If you basically have to have something that goes to the fab, what do you give? Well, what we give is a layout, as we call it. A layout, and that's something that's important, because in this class we're going to do some layout. It's trying to basically help us to design those masks, right? That's the key goal. The outcome of your whole process of design is going to be a set of masks, right? Now, how do we go to those masks? From what we see, you're sitting there, you've been spending a lot of time, and you come up with a circuit diagram. Right, so you have come up with something that looks like this, PMOS, NMOS, da 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 So that's the inverter. Right. That's what you have come up with. You have figured out the transistor sizes and all this kind of thing. So the next step you're going to do is map this into a number of geometrical patterns. Uh, interconnect layers, uh, transistor areas, source, drain areas, and so on and so forth. But rather than doing this in a three-dimensional fashion, we're going to translate this in a number of two-dimensional steps. Looking on the top, basically. You look at the top of your chip, and you say, well, I need some wires that are polysilicon. So I'm going to put some polygons down that look like polysilicon. And I color them red. Red is for polysilicon. I need metal wires, or I need some contacts, obviously. So you have some contacts here. There's some square holes. I need some metal wires. That's blue. Here's my transistor. That's diffusion. So I have a source region and a drain region. And where you have the gate in between, that's going to be your channel. So green means diffusion, N plus, let's say, for an NMOS transistor. I make a square. So here's an N square, which is N plus. Where I put a polysilicon over it, I have a transistor. Because now I have a source, a drain, and a piece of polysilicon that's going to determine where my gate region is going to be. Where the green and the red overlap, we have silicon dioxide. So you as designer, the only thing you have to figure out is where to put the polysilicon, where to put the N-plus material, how to make the metallization patterns to connect to it. And that's really your design effort. That's your physical design. You don't have to think about exactly how it's going to work out, how thick it's going to be. Now you just find patterns. And the way the patterns are going to structure is going to determine the layer, layout area of your chip. Right? 
So that's the ask, task of doing layout. Then I think um, probably in the second lab, uh, not the first lab, the second separate lab, we're going to start doing layout. Gonna lay out some inverters, some gates, trying to figure out how this all works. Now the key question you ask yourself then obviously is, can I do anything? What's going to determine my, uh, the limits of what I can do? Why not make this red thing one nanometer wide? Could I do that? Uh, that's really be nice, right? Then I have a transistor which has a channel length of only one nanometer. New technology. Now that wouldn't work obviously, right? Uh, because you're working in a 90 nanometer technology, and the fact that I draw this little line of one nanometer means that probably is not going to work. So there's some other things that come into the game. It's a set of rules. Every process will tell you, wait a second, the thinnest line you can draw is going to be this. Right? The closest you can bring lines together is going to be this. The smallest transistor you can make is going to be this. The largest transistor you can make is going to be this. So you have a set of rules. We call them design rules. And the design rules are going to guide you in the process of taking this artifact in such a way that when you draw it and you bring it to the fab and you make your mask and you run your chip, it's going to work from a manufacturing perspective. Okay? We'll come back to design rules later. But basically, can you imagine? So the task of a design is you do your circuits, you come up with all your transistors, their sizes, and ultimately you're going to translate this into an artifact, which is a bunch of polygons uh, on different layers. Just like you do with Adobe Photoshop or anything. You have different layers. You can every layer is a different material or different step. Okay? So that's important to remember. So it brings us back to cost. So I think I explained to you what the process is. You you design as designer, you come up with your polygons. You go to the mask shop. The mask shop is going to translate that picture into a set of films. And then it goes to the fab and they do this step over and over and over again. And ultimately a processed wafer comes out of that. So let's look a little bit at the recurring costs. So recurring costs is, oh, well, let's first do NRE. I'm basically going back to the cost. Set. Let's first do this here, the non-recurring cost, and, and, and show you a little bit why the costs have gone up recently. And then we're going to go to recurring cost and what's going to determine how big a chip you want to make. Okay? So NRE costs. Um, I mentioned that um, here's a, a picture that was from um, about a couple of years ago that shows uh, it's a slide that was used in industry. Um, basically says, well, gee, who can afford to build a new chip? Right? That's always the question. If I basically a little company, I have a startup, and I go to my venture capitalist guy, and the guy says, I give you $10 million to make your chip. Right? That's pretty cool, $10 million. Now, what can I do with $10 million? Turns out not much if you want to design a chip. Today, you want to design a new chip, go to the venture capital guys, the guys who give you all these nice donors and stock options and all this kind of stuff, which is kind of cool, uh, ask for $70 million. It's going to be close to reality. So if it's not cheap to make a chip because of the fact that a bunch of things have gotten a lot more expensive. And definitely, if you go to smaller feature size, I say masks are a big factor. We're talking about $10 million, $5 to $10 million for a mask set. And you have to have the tools, and you have to have the design time, and you have to have the verification time, and all those type of things. So those things have gone up substantially. This is the cost of masks. And, and this now goes to 65 nanometers, about right here. And you can see 65 nanometers, about 4 million. Yeah, that was overestimated. It was more like 3 or 3.5. But I said, but the more we make things smaller, the harder it gets to basically print those patterns. You have to have more expensive steppers. The patterns that you print are kind of bizarre too, but I'm, I'm not going to go into detail on that. So NRE costs are basically going up because of that reason, and, and you have to be aware of that. Uh, productivity trends, I showed you briefly this picture. You know, um, the complexity of chips built goes up every generation, right? And that's the blue curve. You can print it out. It's okay. Uh, these are the number of logic transistors per chip. Moore's law, pure Moore's law. You can predict how it's going to go, and, and you can see these are real measurements. It has stayed on that line for a very long time. It still is on that line. It hasn't changed. Now, you look at the productivity of a single engineer. How many transistors can a single engineer design in a day? That's the key question you ask yourself, right? 
So we say it's improving all the time, but it's not, if, not, if it doesn't improve at the same rate, then I have this gap that basically increases. Right? So you can see that if this reasoning would hold, the design teams would get bigger and bigger and bigger. However, this is fake as an argument because every so many times it says, no, this doesn't work anymore. We cannot do that. We're going to do a new strategy. And you come up with something to make your productivity suddenly two or three times better by coming up with a new abstraction, by buying process from somebody else, by not doing all the stuff your own again, reuse, all those things I talked about. That creates step functions. It's not linear. Suddenly you have a step function, and then you go linear again. And you have another step function, you go linear again. Right? So be aware of that. But productivity trends, the bottom line, however, still design is getting a lot more expensive. So you have to think twice before you say, well, that inverter that's in libraries, I, I know if I can change a little bit, it's going to be better. Very bad idea. Uh, you gain a little bit, and you're going to spend a month checking out if it really works or not. Right? So reusing things of the past is an example of actually basically making things more productive and reducing costs. Oops. OK. OK. So now let's go to the variable cost. So the fixed cost is quite simple, right? You have a certain amount. You can say, I, I estimated at $15 million to design this thing, do the math, all this type of thing. So your cost per chip is going to be that fixed cost divided by the volume. Right? The more I make, the more I amortize that single cost over a whole bunch of components. Key question is now the other part is the variable cost. What's going to determine the cost per IC? How much extra do I have to pay for every more chip, every chip more that I make? And so the variable cost. Oh, oops. Now, the variable cost in itself is not very hard to figure out. So I look at the cost of a die. OK. How much does it make the single chip? Right. Plus uh, the cost of the testing. I have to test that chip plus the cost of the packaging. So the cost of a chip is the silicon, plus the packaging, plus the testing of the chip. And then there's another thing. Obviously, some of those chips might not work, or some of the packaging fails. So you have to f divide this by the number of working parts. We call that the yield. 20%, 30%, 90%, whatever it is. Obviously, I like to have be 100%. The 100% is more economic. You basically can see any time your yield goes down, the cost per chip goes up. Okay, So cost of a die, cost of die test, cost of packaging. Um, die test is important, too, because um, that's why there's a, something like a test engineer. Testers are also big machines. All those things are big machines. So your chips come in, a wafer probe goes down, a bunch of probes go on the die, and they send patterns in. And they measure what's happening as a response. And they, as many patterns. Now, you can imagine, if you have a very complex design, you're going to have to set a lot of patterns in before you kind of figure out if it works or not. So this thing is going to be spending more time in the tester. The more patterns I have to send through it, the more time in the tester. Testers are expensive, so the cost of the test goes up with the test time. So trying to find ways of testing chip in such a way that you know quickly if the thing does the right job, always is important because it reduces that cost of the test. Okay, because once again, you have to think about the cost of the tester. So, but let's think a little bit about this yield thing. What's going to determine yield? Right, how many chips do work? Well, again, there's no rocket science in there. Well, there is some. There's some statistical probabilistic stuff in there. So that might be rocket science if you want it that way. Okay, so here's your typical wafer. This is an example. This is a wafer from uh, AMD. I think this is a probably a 12-inch wafer. A uh, bunch of microprocessors. You can see here every square is an individual chip. So you have the single dies, like the yellow, the white thing box here shows a single die. So in a single wafer this big, you basically fill it up with rows and rows and rows and columns of those different dies. So you can see, on a, depending upon the size of the chip, I get more chips per wafer or not, right? So the cost of a die is now the cost of the wafer, which is your processing. Right? You get the wafer, and you get your basic silicon material, and then I have all the costs of moving it through my fab. Right? 
cost of the wafer, the dice per wafer, how many dice do I get? If I obviously get many, many, many more chips, I'm going to have a small cost per chip. But also depending on the die yield, right? If, if, I, have a, if I have only 1% working versus 90% working, that's a very big difference. So that's an important thing. The cost of a die is the cost of the wafer, dice per wafer, and the die yield. Now, there's two parameters in here that we have to figure out. The cost of the wafer is fairly easy to figure out. Uh, you figure out uh, how much you pay for the basic material, right? And some materials are more expensive than other ones. Um, and then you basically, how much does it cost me in general to run a wafer to the fab? Uh, personnel you pay, all those kind of things obviously add to the cost of that processing, right? So you can figure that out. But dice per wafer and die yield are interesting numbers. So let's think a little bit about dice per wafer and how that's a function of the area of a chip. OK, just to give an example here, these are different wafers. Um, when I started my, in, in, in my, my, my PhD way back, I was working on wafers that were about an inch. It was like this little circle of thing about this big. I might show you one in one of the next lectures. Uh, today, they have moved on 90 nanometers, 8 inch, 90 nanometer went to 12 inch. 65 nanometers, 12 inch as well. 12 inch, it's like a pizza, about this size. So fairly big chunks of silicon. A lot of companies now talk about bigger wafers, right? Um, if you're making a lot of parts, like memory or microprocessors, it kind of makes sense to have a bigger wafer. Because you make more chips at the same time, your cost is going to go down. So Intel, Samsung, and some other companies, they're really pushing on 18-inch wafers. The guys who don't like it, the guys who make the manufacturing equipment, because it's expensive to make bigger and newer equipment for all those bigger wafers. And you have fewer customers, because it's only Intel, Samsung, and those companies that can afford to buy those things. Right? So it's a kind of different economics. Now they say 18-inch wafers should be there. I was just reading it yesterday. It says pushed out to about 2015, 16, we're going to go to. 30 centimeters, about this size. Pretty nice chunks. Now, here's a funny one. This was from a talk that Gordon Moore gave a couple of years ago. He says, I've been good, I've been good in many, many things, predicting. Moore's law, obviously pretty amazing. Four years later, still valid. He said, there's one error I made. If I looked at the uh, projected wafer, I had an equation for the wafer size, how it would grow. And if you tra extrapolate that equation from 1975 till now, a wafer would be 75, uh, 57 inches. You know, this is what it would look like. It would basically have a giant plate. Obviously, it didn't happen. That's more like the reality. This guy is in, on the left side here. That's a real wafer. This is a projected wafer. So projections sometimes go, go wrong. If definitely you can't do an exponential, and you do it year after year after year, it can go wrong at some point in time. Uh, so it was not always accurate. This is Gordon Moore himself who said that. So it's, I'm, I didn't say that. OK, let's think about yield again. Um, what's the yield? Yield is number of dies on a wafer, right? Divided by the number of good dies, the ones that really work. OK, so that's the equation of a yield. Good ones divided by the total number. The die cost is equal to the wafer cost, dies per wafer, and die yield. We mentioned that already. Now think a little bit about dies per wafer. There's one unfortunate thing about a wafer. The most unfortunate thing about the wafer is what? Is round. We never make, round is not very easy to fit things in, right? If I have chips that are typically square or rectangular. So what I have to do is fit as many rectangles into a circular space. And everything that's on the boundary, you will see that's on a wafer, you see the lithography, everything on the wafer, you have chips that basically only half printed. You have to throw those away. So now, you can imagine that if my, yes, yes, it's basically the building of the material. The way this wafers get built, it's made from what's called an ingot. They pull, it's like they make silicon, purify it, and melt it. Right? There's a big bath of silicon, and then they put purify it in such a way that uh, you don't have any particles sitting in there. So it has to be as pure as possible. And then they slowly cool it to make sure that you basically create a, uh, a uh, grid, 
single crystalline piece of silicon, right? There's a single crystal you're building. And you pull it out. While you're cooling it off, you basically pull out, and it becomes this massive column, circular column of silicon. And then they go to a sawing machine, a sawing blade that basically slices it into a narrow slice of a couple of millimeters thick. So that ingot is always circular by the whole process they're using. Uh, it almost looks like steel making, right? It's uh, hot baths, it melts the stuff, you pull things out, really high temperature, and then you have to be very careful. I say you want to make sure you have single crystal. So but you can imagine that, so as a result of this, all the corner things around the edge are lost. Now, if I make my chips very small, I right, let's say I have chips of a millimeter, the amount of chips I'm going to lose, the amount of area I'm going to lose is going to be much smaller than when my chips are really big. As you can see in those two pictures here. I can see that here with the smaller chip, I'm much more effective in using silicon than basically when I have larger chips. So the dice per wafer is a simple equation that takes into account total area divided by die area. Right? That's straightforward. I take the whole pi r squared divided by the die area. And then you subtract all the ones that are non-functional. And that's given by this expression here. All the ones that are in these regions here. So you can see that the dice per wafer is a strong function of the die area. And it's a little bit more complex than linear or 1 over x because of this secondary component, which really becomes a big factor when you have really big chips. Like mic large microprocessors are about 2 centimeters on the side. You can see there's a lot of lost material. Okay? So, that's a f so now we have this factor. We have the total dice per wafer. We have the wafer cost. We still have to figure out die yield. What's going to determine yield? Now, well, there's a variety of things, but one primary process thing is that your wafer is never going to be ideal. Whatever you do, you basically try to make a big chunk of silicon and you have to make a crystal that's perfect. Right? Every atom has to be lining up perfectly with the other atoms, and no impurities can be allowed. No other particles are allowed in there. Never happens. There always will be some dysfunctioning where your crystal is distorted or other particles come in. And that's going to determine your yield, at least from a pure materials perspective. Uh, there's other things that may determine yield, but I'm not going to go in there right now. But again, if suppose I have a wafer like this. I have a wafer with big chips and a wafer with small chips. As you can see, the red dots are impurities or faults in the silicon material. Now, what's the probability of a chip working? In both cases, you can see if I have really big chips, suppose I have one chip on the whole wafer. Every, none of those chips will ever work because all the impurities will always fall into that chip. At the same time that I make my chip smaller, the probability that I will have no impurity or no fault is going up. I, so you can imagine that the yield of a chip, the number of working components because of faulty inverse is going to be better, it's going to be a function of the area. The larger the area, the lower my yield will become. Okay? Um, purely statistical. Right? You, have a, you have to understand a certain distribution of faults. You have to understand where, why faults happen. You build a statistical model, and out of that, I can come up with some equation. As I say, this is maybe where the rocket science is in. Coming up with an equation like this that basically predicts, given the die area, what the die yield is going to look like. <clears throat> they have come up with some expressions. Most of those are empirical. They measure it. They, they have a parameter alpha. You measure it, and then you figure out what alpha is. Alpha typically is about 3. But the bottom line is uh, where I want to conclude for today is that the die cost is not only proportional, but it's basically a fourth order function of the die area. That's strong, right? You make a chip two times longer or smaller my cost is going to go up with a factor of 16, approximately. In reality, it's not that much. It's, it's more like this. The cost goes like this, and then <coughs> <coughs> if I stay be below a certain size, it goes up a little bit, maybe linear or something like that. But when you really go to big chips, your cost is going to go up substantially. So try to stay away from that. 
is one. Number two is smaller is better. If you can make your chip smaller, it's good from an economics perspective in an important way. So that's something to keep your mind. Every time you do chips, just don't be sloppy. Oh, I'm going to put a multiplier here, now something out there, and put some wires in between. It's bad from your cost perspective. It's also bad from a performance perspective because long wires are slow. So smaller is better is the key message here that I want to bring out of that. But that gives you some idea on what determines this kind of reasoning. Yes? Yeah. Oh, yeah. You can be clever. Right? If I basically will build an SRAM chip today, SRAM chip, um, let's say 200 megabits chip, SRAM, the chances that a chip is going to work are about zero. And, um, I, I won't give you a dime for it unless you have some ways of figuring out that this is a fairly large die. You know there's going to be some uh, imperfections, things like that. It's going to fail. One bit might be wrong, but you have to throw the whole chip away for one bit. Not very clever. So virtually every memory chip has what's called redundancy mechanisms that if you, you can detect at test time that some parts are not working, you swap in other ones. Redundancy, error correction, all those kind of things. Clearly, you're right. What this does is you can actually improve the yield of your die by basically clever design. It's not purely a function of error. It's also how clever are you to deal with imperfections that happen. That's where smart designers come in. And it's more and more important because not only of manufacturing but also of variability reason and things like that, the chance that chips are going to work completely is getting smaller and smaller and smaller because I'm putting billions of transistors on a die. And the chance of all the transitions.